Well, good morning and welcome to this Harding Evans webinar. Um, today we're joined by Bethan Evans and by Ben Jenkins. We are going to be discussing um, emerging from lockdown. And my name is James Young and I'm an associate in the commercial department. So we're just going to take a moment now for Ben to introduce himself and Ben Beth will introduce herself afterwards just to explain a little bit about their roles and what they do. So Ben, if we turn to you firstly, please. Thank you, James. Yeah, I'm Ben Jenkins. I head up the commercial disputes team here at Harding Evans. Um, been here 13 years now. Um, so not only do I deal with disputes, but I have a lot of experience in assisting businesses and supporting them and set up proper structures, um, put in place the, the right agreements to allow them to really minimise risk, focus on their business and, and hopefully drive down the risk of, of getting into um, costly and unpleasant disputes. Um, too often, I'm sure it's the case for, for Beth as well, I encounter people who um, don't have proper agreements in place that you know, regulate their relationships with third parties. Um, and then, so when things go wrong, they can go very wrong if those agreements aren't in place. Thanks, Ben. And Beth, if you can just introduce yourself and give us a bit of a, a background to yourself, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, James. Um, so I'm um, Beth Evans. I'm a licensed insolvency practitioner and I'm a partner at Menzies. Um, I advise businesses and individuals that are struggling financially and um, are owed money by somebody. Um, I look at how to avoid insolvency um, and how to prevent an insolvency by turning the finances around and sometimes restructuring the business. Um, it's not always possible to restructure a business, particularly if there's too much creditor pressure um, or if there's too little cash or too little time. So in those kind of cases, I will advise on how to enter an insolvency process in a controlled manner, um, in a manner that considers the interests of the stakeholders and maximises the amount of money that goes to creditors. Thank you. So before we begin then, so we're seeing now um, that the lockdown is slowly being lifted and that government support is starting to taper off. And I think we're starting to see more restructuring uh, through redundancies and administrations. And it does look like there could be some tough times ahead. And, and I can see that uh, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020 has recently obtained royal assent. And most of the provisions uh, have commenced from Friday 26, 2020, save for some temporary business protection measures uh, enacted. Um, and these have retrospective uh, effect from 1st of March 2020. So looking at some of the questions we've had posed to us, um, the first question we've had is, so what pitfalls do, do you foresee for businesses emerging from the lockdown? And perhaps Ben, if we came to you first on that point, um, to get your kind of insight uh, on some uh, points there. Yeah, certainly. Um, um, so. For directors, um, they need to be very aware of their their duties. Um, so whether that's promoting the success of the company or um, to exercise um, reasonable care, skill, and diligence in their role, um, you know, I'm acutely aware that a lot of directors, shareholders, partners um, will be feeling the strain um, and will have very sort of deeply personal reasons for, for acting in a certain way that they are that might not be um, the norm. And I think it's fair to say that that, that combined with you know, a bit of distance, perhaps not being able to measure what people are doing, um, can cause a bit of mistrust, can be a bit of a hotbed for um, dispute to arise. Um, in circumstances where people are very keen to, to protect their business, protect their livelihood um, in the current crisis. Um, and so, you know, with that and also the, the uncertainty that's, that is um, still out there and will be out there for a while, I'm afraid, um, in, particularly in certain sectors, such as the hospitality sector, or although, as you say, James, things are being 
relax, so fingers crossed that has the desired impact. Um, but businesses will also have to be paying loans back, etc. Um, and directors will be, or should be at least aware of the potential for challenges by shareholders who are you know, equally keen to, to protect their interests and remedies that are available to them under, <clears throat> for example, the Section 994 of the Companies Act for Unfair Prejudice, um, where they feel that the interests um, or that the affairs of the company are being conducted in a, a manner that's unfairly prejudicial to um, all or, or part of the members of the company. Uh, there's also the, the right for them in certain circumstances to dismiss directors um, and they can also um, prevent what they, they see as unlawful transactions. Um, there's the, the spectre of directors disqualification proceedings that are possible um, and the risk of insolvency related proceedings. So it's for directors um, and other business people generally, um, it's about you know, knowing your duties, um, acting accordingly, um, taking the right advice, certainly, evidencing meetings um, and decisions that are made so you can demonstrate that you do have uh, the, the best interests of wider stakeholders at heart. Um, and it, it's also about making sure you have agreements in place. Because um, I, I get instructed, um, for example, in, in respect of shareholder disputes and the number of shareholders that, that come to me that don't have an agreement in place at all, shareholders agreement governing the relationship between, between shareholders, etc., um, is, is fairly often. And if they do, sometimes they're not as, as robustly drafted as I was like. And, and they can be very important in governing, as I said, the, the relationship between them, but also what happens in the event of a dispute, um, particularly when, for example, you have 50-50 shareholding and there's that potential for a, a deadlock situation. Well, Ben, th thank you for those insightful comments on, on the legal side. Um, if we turn to Beth now on the insolvency side, Beth, could you just give us some, some comments to, uh, to that as well, please? That would be great. Yeah, so um, as I see it, where, as we're sort of emerging from lockdown, the risk to businesses is going to be there's there's a lot of pent up demand um, that's um, pent up over the last couple of months, and business owners will rush to supply that demand. Um, and if they've not planned appropriately, um, and they've got a um, diminished cash from the months of lockdown, which a lot of people probably possibly will find themselves uh, with diminished cash, they'll risk over trading. Um, and that is running out of cash to be able to supply goods and services to um, to to, the, to that demand, um, and that's the initial risk. Um, but there's also um, a, the risk, as Ben mentioned, of that debt that's been kicked down the uh, the street. Um, so there are payment holidays that a lot of businesses have had, and those are going to come to an end. Um, there are also deferred payments that um, a lot of businesses have taken um, advantage of, uh, the likes of the revenue deferred um, deferred payment schemes, um, and those will become due um, as we emerge from lockdown and you know in, in over the course of the next six months to a year. Um, and so the risk to um, the business is that as those become due, um, cash um, may not be there to be able to pay those debts um, and, and businesses start to struggle. Um, there are a lot of um, there are a number of factors that might contribute um, to to lack of cash as well as um, the things I talked about. And I would really say that forecasting is really important um, and analysing your cash flows that, um, that, that that your projections into the next um, year, two years, um, because there are a lot of things, and you need to analyse those those cash flow forecasts because there are a lot of things that can change over the period over that period, and that can include um, customer and supply chain failures. And that'll have a knock on effect on people's cash, um, staff sickness, you know, we're in a pandemic of a, of a nasty virus that could impact productivity, certainly in service sectors um, and have an impact on cash flow um, and, um, and future lockdowns as well, you know, with 
possibly going to see those in, in, in isolated areas. Um, so those are some of the things that um, businesses need to be aware of and the risks, um, but there are also some of the, the things that people can look um, at planning for um, and, and, and looking at mitigating those risks ahead. Um, Picking up on Ben's point about um, uncertainty, you know, that's a really big risk, uncertainty in an economy, and, um, and the government is trying to protect about, against that by um, creating more certainty um, to try and sort of reignite our economy. You know, we're, we're, we're getting the, the lockdown restrictions lifted to try and generate that, um, that bit of certainty so that we all know where we're, where, where we're going um, from here. Um, but as Ben says, um, you know, uncertainty um, can really breed mistrust um, and that's where you can often end up with these um, these disputes within a business um, from my perspective um, you know disputes are dangerous because they can mean that people take their eye off the ball um, and um, and value in a business can be diminished um, through through that um, dispute um, you know because each party um, will look to maxim maximize their own position um, and they won't consider necessarily the interests of wider stakeholder groups um, you know navigating that um, emotional roller coaster particularly for owner managed businesses you know where I think Ben mentioned you know you've got 50 50 shareholders maybe and um, it's a real emotional roller coaster because people um, businesses they're, they're our livelihood aren't they and they um, we put a lot of passion um, into them so it can be quite emotional if we have a dispute um, and wearing diff the different hats the, the, the director's hat and the shareholder's hat um, we, we have to do different roles and we have to remember that we have our director's duties as well as our investment and our shareholding to consider and we have to make sure that we do the right thing depending on which hat we're wearing um, and that can be really challenging so that's where it's really important to get um, some professional advice um, so that we don't sort of trip up um, so yeah those are sort of the risks that I see as we come out of lockdown. Well thanks Beth for pointing out those pitfalls um, now if we turn to the next question that we've had so what if things start to go wrong? Um, ben, perhaps you can jump in and uh, give us some uh, advice on, on, on that point, please. Sure. Uh, it's very important in my view to, to act quickly to try and resolve the dispute so it doesn't fester um, and parties' positions don't become too ingrained. There are options um, available for that kind of resolution, hopeful resolution, um, but it's about knowing which one's right and then carrying out a cost benefit analysis because you know, there are different implications um, for different types of avenues, such as, for example, negotiation, um, standard negotiation where parties, um, either through written correspondence or in a meeting, um, on a what's called a, a without prejudice basis can um, and, and to say without prejudice means that statements made um, by the parties won't be submitted to court on issues of liability before the issue is determined really so it encourages the freedom of those parties to speak frankly to try and resolve the dispute um, and that whether it's by meeting or correspondence is fairly cost effective if, if it results in settlement um, but then there's more formal sort of um, routes that you can go down, such as mediation, where you'd have um, a third party mediator jointly instructed um, at cost um, and hopefully with professional um, experience in, in the subject matter of the dispute to help facilitate the parties reach your settlements. So they're not a judge, but they try and push the parties really to, to try and um, narrow the issues and ideally to settle um, completely. Um, other options are arbitration, um, which is binding on the parties um, so in certain situations, um, but can be more costly in my experience than mediation, again with a, a professional arbitrator who knows the area in dispute. Um, there's adjudication as well, um, which from my experience is a fairly breakneck um, speed sort of resolution situation where um, it's, it's more for simple disputes um, when the parties want to maintain some form of commercial relationship going forward and, and usually it's about sort of four to six weeks they take and um, so it, it can be fairly quick um, and obviously 
so that that's the point of what I said earlier about a cost benefit analysis, because you don't want to incur significant costs in mediation when it's likely that there won't be a resolution or if it's just disproportionate in terms of cost to, to have your legal advisors there and your mediator there, um, it may not be proportionate and, and reasonable to engage in that sort of process. Um, they can be heated, you know, it, it can give the parties an opportunity to um, say how they feel, whether that be opposite the other party on around a table face to face, that sometimes works. Um, as you can imagine, sometimes it, it really doesn't. <laughs> and it can it can mean that the parties become a little bit more um, ingrained. But as with all settlements, there's you know, there's the commercial factor. Um, businesses want to be able to deal with the dispute and get back to, to driving their business, doing what they enjoy, um, hopefully preserve some some goodwill so a trading relationship can continue. Um, but you know. I should say as well that the courts very much encourage um, and it's ingrained in the civil procedure rules that are set for parties engaging in a dispute. They very much encourage the parties to attempt um, various forms of ADR. So the, the options I mentioned are different forms of alternative dispute resolution, those ADR methods. And it can be that a judge, even if a party is, is successful in litigation at the end of trial, a judge can order that that successful party pay the costs of the losing party um, because of their poor conduct in in whether it's unreasonably refusing to mediate or ignoring alternative dispute resolution altogether. When of course the, the rule of thumb is usually that the um, losing party pays the winning party's costs. A judge has discretion to reverse that. So it's obviously something that's very important to consider. Thanks for that, Ben. And then, Beth, can you kind of follow on then from what Ben, ben has then ju just mentioned from the insolvency perspective? Sure. Um, I mean, I quite often will see um, disputes that um, arise as a result of one party owing another party money. Um, and um, in my experience, um, you know, any kind of dispute, if it's goes on for, 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 for any periods of time, it costs a lot of money, um, you know, as well as costing that time. Um, I, I've seen other disputes um, where they're between shareholders um, and they just take somebody's, um, take, take up a lot of that person's time and they take their eye off the business, as I said earlier, and we have that sort of loss of value um, and, and that um, cash pinch can then um, very much lead to an insolvency. Um, so if a business is um, maybe you know, not necessarily in a um, dispute about um, money that they owe to, um, to, to somebody, um, they, they, they're in a dispute with one another, that could be really detrimental. But also there might be disputes about a customer that owes um, them money um, as well. And that can similarly take a lot of time um, and a lot of money to deal with and can mean that people take their eye off the ball. Obviously, it's good to make sure that you um, you follow up with them these disputes so that you get that cash into the business that I talked about so that you don't end up with that cash pinch. Um, but I think what I'd say is that, you know, picking up on what Ben said, um, the best thing is communication. And if you can avoid any form of... Um, a, you know, aggressive um, action, um, that, that's far better um, than, than, than ones that require um, the court um, and, and therefore cost more. Um, the worst thing that I see is when people yeah. stop talking um, and um, businesses shut down and don't speak to um, the other side. Um, and that does mean that the other side have to um, enter the, the more aggressive recovery strategies. Um, they've got no alternative. Um, and that's, again, where... Um, I sometimes have to come in um, and start restructuring a business because a creditor has started putting pressure on, um, which maybe means that the business um, has to go into a formal insolvency procedure. Maybe there's a petition outstanding. Maybe there's a statutory demand that's been issued. Um, and the options really start to um, get taken away when that happens because we don't have any time left um, to really think about a restructuring um, in, a, in an informal sense. We have to go down some 
um, some of the more formal um, insolvency routes. Um, so what I'd say is, um, you know, some payments better than no payment. If you are struggling, um, try and make um, some payment to um, your suppliers um, that way um, and enter into that communication. Um, that way you're more likely to have some sort of longevity in your business and credit managers are going to be a risk assessing their ledgers um, and they're going to be looking at you if you're talking to them and thinking that you're less of a risk so they're less likely to start going down those um the, the, those sort of more um uh more scary um insolvency um uh, sort of type actions like uh, like petitions it's it's worth mentioning as well i think that that the new act is well obviously we always encourage people to to communicate and, and sort things out between themselves. The new act as well has, has put in place some um, breathing space for, for parties to a certain extent. So um, it, it, you often see in commercial supply contracts, for example, um, that there's a right to terminate if the other party enters into some form of insolvency process. And those clauses are, are pretty widely drafted. Um, so the, the new act essentially suspends that, that right um, or overrides the right, I suppose, um, in certain circumstances during the, the, the COVID period, so up till 30th of September, um, prevents the party from, from being able to do that. Um, there are exceptions um, to that, I should say as well, that um, if they meet two of the three um, following criteria, that's turnover less than 10.2 million, balance sheet less than 5.1 million, and fewer than 50 employees, so two of those three mean the exemption. But it, it just goes towards what the government's trying to do um, to, to assist parties um, to almost try and to force them to, to engage in more um, communication and, and try and settle things without going down those sorts of um, severe routes that, that Beth was talking about. Yes, and um, you know the the new act that you're talking about there, Ben, um, has also brought in um, a suspension of the wrongful trading um, provisions. Um, so business owners will um, will welcome those um, that that suspension because um, you know it's it's a very difficult period, and you know there's a concern that people may have been trading wrongfully during the period. But of course, if the, there's a suspension of those wrongful trading provisions, business owners can carry on without that concern sort of looming. Um, um, you know, wrongful trading, just um, for those that may not be aware, is a claim that can be brought by a liquidator or an administrator, um, and it can result in um, a director being asked to personally contribute to an insolvent estate um, to return money to creditors. Um, it's where a director knew or ought to have known that there was no reasonable prospect of avoiding insolvent liquidation or administration. Um, and it's all about the loss to the creditors um, and, and whether or not a director should have taken reasonable steps to minimise the loss to the creditors. Um, if they don't do that and the position worsens, that's when directors um, are at risk. Um, and whilst the new act has suspended the provision, people mustn't forget that, um, you know, touching on what you said earlier, Ben, about the um, wider duties, director's duties, you know, they're, they're um, enshrined in the, um, in the Companies Act, um, and yes, then a director may not be ordered to make a contribution to the insolvent, insolvent estate under the wrongful trading provisions, but there are still other mechanisms where a liquidator might seek a contribution to the estate, um, and those are through misfeasance um, claims um, or a straightforward um, you know, breach of fiduciary duty claim. Um, so, you know, we shouldn't sort of rest on our laurels about the uh, suspension of the wrongful trading. Um, and the, um, the, 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 the new Act, the, the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act, has also brought into play this new moratorium, um, that the, the, this new tool that um, insolvency practitioners and businesses have at their fingertips to allow more time for a struggling business to, um, to, to review whether or not it needs to be restructured and protect it from aggressive action, um, aggressive creditor action. So um, it gives that breathing space, um, it allows a business to be reviewed um, and it allows a plan to be put in place that hopefully will avoid a formal insolvency. Um, and that, that means that the business will continue to trade 
during the moratorium, uh, value will be preserved. Um, and most importantly, those people that are supplying that business, that struggling business, um, will have a better opportunity to recover any debt that they're owed so maybe there's a lot of money that they're owed they're continuing to supply this business in moratorium um, with a view to this business um, restructuring and coming out the other side and being able to pay that sort of historic debt and don't forget that there will be that there is this new super priority status that has um, been granted for those creditors that continue to supply, supply the business during the moratorium so the idea is that they're not going to be put in a worse position by continuing to trade with the business in moratorium actually this is going to be better for everybody because the business will be restructured, it will succeed, and everybody will get their value back um, in, in, in the long term. Uh, so yeah, really good stuff from that new act. Well, thanks for that, Beth. So the next question, uh, we all know that cash flow is so important to a business. In fact, it's vital. Um, and we've seen recent reports that businesses, even before the pandemic was hitting us, that they were struggling with cash flow. So probably for, for a lot of business owners and directors, they're going to want to know, well, what are the best routes I can go down in relation to debt recovery for my business? Um, so really addressing the question to you both. Um, Beth, could, could you give us your, your thoughts on, on that point? take myself off mute for a second yes so um it's important to keep on top of your debt collection like i've um you know i've said um bit before um you know cash is really critical um to the working capital cycle and taking your cat your eye off your debt collection um can mean that um cash could quite easily dry up so you know it's it's really important to um to to, to monitor it closely um and, and maintain a um a a, um, a close eye on it. Everybody's going to be managing their cash though very closely and carefully at the moment. Um, and you know, it, it may be that um, the number of days that it takes for um, somebody to pay you is going to start increasing. Um, there's a there can sometimes be a feeling of maybe not wanting to chase a customer too um, too hard because of the risk of losing that customer if you put too much pressure on them for payment, especially if they're, they're having a few difficulties. Um, but what you've got to remember um, as, as a business owner or a director is that that um, non-payment can be quite detrimental to your business um, if they're withholding that, that valuable cash resource. Um, and you know, as I, as I said earlier, increased, in, those increased debt to days can really be one of the factors that can lead to cash flow shortages within an organisation and put a business in jeopardy. Um, so really, you know, if they're not going to pay you, um, you can't pay your staff, you can't pay your stock, you can't pay your overheads, do you want them as a customer? Um, going back to um, you know what we were saying earlier communication is so so important um, it will help to um, help you to risk assess your ledger um, and regular those regular ledger reviews and regular telephone calls um, quite straightforward telephone calls are really key um, to, um, to to it to doing that risk assessment um, you need to understand where your payment's coming from is it going to be a payment plan is it going to be a grace period you know does, does, does your customer need a grace period um, you know because are they getting further funding and, uh, and things like that um, or is it just um, one of those debtors that is not going to communicate with you and um, you need to go and get some legal advice now there's currently a stay on um, on sort of statutory um, demands and petitions and they're a really useful tool when you reach a conclusion that a relationship isn't any good um, anymore and, and that that person's maybe stopped communicating with you um, so you know you may need to go and get some legal advice um, to, to help you through that process if you do need a petition to, uh, to, to recover your debt. Yeah it, as, as Beth said it's there are temporary restrictions on um, creditors who can petition to, to wind up a company Again, just sort of that, during that COVID period, a general restriction on um, issuing winding up petitions. So it's between 27th of April um, and 30th of 
September, um, unless the credit has reasonable grounds for believing that coronavirus has not had um, a financial effect on the company, um, which is going to be obviously fairly difficult to, to prove, um, and that the issues would have arisen even if um, coronavirus had not impacted the company financially, which again is going to be difficult. So that's a real caution to, to creditors um, before petitioning. Um, is they need to make absolutely sure and take advice so they can meet those those criteria. Um, otherwise, it could mean that the petition is dismissed um, and you may be ordered to pay um, damages and, and costs as a result um, to the other side, which would obviously be catastrophic, um, throwing good money after bad. So um, after that COVID period, so after the 30th of, of September, it's um, likely we'll probably see a, a return to very aggressive um, debt recovery methods because companies, a lot of companies are obviously very desperate to get that all important cash in. Um, and that's all obviously subject to, to further government intervention in that regard. Um, and, and also um, another point is, is to take care to serve um, documents properly. So I'm aware of a recent case where a council office was was closed and known to be closed someone um issued court proceedings against them um they were served at that closed address um and it turns out that the council did apply to set aside um a, a default judgment that had been um obtained because there was no defense or acknowledgement served because of that closure and they were successful in setting aside that default judgment on the basis they had reasonable grounds of successfully defending the claim, which is one of the, the key criteria for, for that sort of application. But the judge indicated that they would have set aside um, that default judgment um, in any event based on um, lack of care on the service point. So it is worth um, taking advice and, and being very careful in those situations. Oh, thanks, Ben. And then turning to our final question, if we take a hypothetical situation where we say either a company's entered liquidation uh, or it's gone through uh, and uh, it's instigated its own voluntary uh, insolvency proceedings, are there any things that credit, creditors can do to actually try and get their money back? Because uh, I know that'll be a very important consideration for creditors. So perhaps Beth, could you give us some insights on the insolvency side on that? Sure. Um, I mean, the key is um, acting quickly um, when you receive that notification that somebody has gone into uh, somebody that owes you money has gone into a um, an insolvency process. Um, the paperwork that you get can sometimes be really overwhelming. Um, there can be quite a lot of it um, and it can end up languishing on somebody's, somebody's desk somewhere for a period of time. Um, speak to um, speak to a, a professional and um, speak to somebody who's um, familiar with the documentation and who, who can help um, help you to complete it maybe it's complete it um, on your behalf review it um, so for example if it's a company voluntary arrangement you're going to receive a big document called the proposal um, it may be worth getting a professional to review that proposal for you to pick out the pertinent points, maybe suggest um, things that you need to ask um, and um, you know, maybe attend any meetings for you um, on your behalf or with you um, to help guide you and help give you a bit of um, a greater insight, a greater knowledge um, on, 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 on how to get your money back and how to protect your position. Um, the forms um, need to be filled in and make sure that you fill them in to register your interest and to make sure that the insolvency practitioner knows that you're owed money and knows exactly how much you're owed. Um, and don't forget that if you've supplied stock to a um, to a company, there might be an opportunity if it's still there to go and pick it up and to go and collect it. Um, if it um, you'd need to have a valid retention of title clause um, and in terms of validity I'll, um, I'll, I'll de defer to, uh, to, to the lawyer on, um, on validity but from my side of things um, the most important thing is making sure that the insolvency practitioners are aware that you've got one in the first place um, and, and making sure that they're aware very quickly so um, yeah communication and acting quickly really important. 
Act and there's no point in having that retention of title clause and then talking about it in six months time because as insolvency practitioners our job is to realise the assets to get as much money into the estate to then pay creditors and we will look to sell the assets um, to the highest bidder quite early on potentially. And, and going back a step really um, and going back to what I was saying at the outset of this that um, businesses need to be familiar with their T's and C's and if they don't have any um, get some drafted as soon as possible um, they need to be well versed in you know, what interest they can charge from what date um, late payment compensation from business debtors and um, if debts can be set off etc so it's it's worth knowing um, and also you don't want a situation where um, a debtor can claim that your T's and C's don't apply um, that that were still theirs do instead, or that they're not properly incorporated into the contract, um, particularly if you have those sorts of um, very important retention title clause that, that Beth mentioned. Um, and, you know, as I was saying, by the time you, you want to rely on that sort of clause, it may very well be too late. So you need to make sure the other party is made aware of your T's and C's before a contract's completed. Um, obviously then T's and C's can't be introduced at a later state, a later stage rather, unless the other party agrees to so take reasonable steps to bring the T's and C's to the other party's attention, um, particularly if you're relying on unusual terms, judges like those to be really flagged up. And um, so I would suggest to clients they have their T's and C's on, on websites, brochures, quotations, um, particularly quotations and, and invoices and proposals. And then if the other side refuses or, or doesn't read them, then that's their fault. And so you need to, to win win the battle of the forms as it's sometimes called um, so if a party the other party might have their own set of t's and c's the rule of thumb is that the t's and c's exchanged prior to um, acceptance or, or performance are those which will usually prevail um, and also just a general point make sure that those t's and c's are in line with the statute such as for example um, the unfair contract terms regulations and and sort of going Back to the, the retention of title clause that, that, ben meant, that Beth mentioned, they're, they're obviously vital. Um, and once you've made sure they're incorporated, they do vary considerably in terms of um, you know, the type of contract they, they are employed in, um, the goods involved, um, whether those goods can be readily identified, um, the circumstances in, in which those clauses can bite. Um, so it is worth getting um, special specialist advice um, on your T's and C's, uh, particularly if um, you're concerned about the other side's financial position, etc. Well, Ben, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your time this morning. Uh, an awful lot to think about there. Some very interesting points raised. Um, I hope those you, those of you who have joined this, you have found this an informative uh, webinar. If you want to get in contact with Ben, Beth or myself, uh, all of our contact details are provided at the end of this webinar. Um, so please feel free to get in contact if you have any questions. And uh, once again, we hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.